that this project is by no means just mine. It's based on the efforts of a combined team of UMass Dartmouth students and local professionals, including Jennifer McRory of Boston's Perkins and Will architectural, film, the architectural Firm. And by the way, Jennifer is the one who gave us this beautiful uh, uh, redesign of UMass Dartmouth Library. Lee Blake, the director of the New Bedford Historical Society, Don Burton, a local documentary filmmaker, and Professor Michael Schwartz of the design department. Today, we have the honor to start this public project through a lecture by Professor John Stoffer of Harvard University. Now, a few words about John and his astonishing accomplishment. John is a leading authority on um, anti-slavery, the Civil War era, social protest movements, and photography. He's a Harvard University professor of English, American literature, and African American studies. His 19 books include the recently published Picturing Frederick Douglass, whose content is the theme of today's talk. Two of his books were national bestsellers and several have won numerous awards. John is also co-curated an exhibition on Douglas and Melville at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. He also has advised three award-winning documentaries and has been a consultant for several feature films. John has held numerous, numerous prestigious fellowships and has appeared on national radio and television and has lectured widely throughout the United States, Asia, and Europe. John received his PhD from Yale University in 1999 and won the Rolf Henry Gabriel Prize for the best dissertation in American studies. He began teaching at Harvard that very same year and was tenured in 2004. John came to Yale and Harvard from a somewhat unlikely route. He was raised in Iowa, Nebraska, and North Dakota, and educated in public schools. After receiving a degree in mechanical engineering from Duke University and working briefly in finance, he received an MA in humanities from Wesleyan University and an MA in American studies from Purdue before pursuing his PhD at Yale. At Harvard, John teaches courses on protest and Southern literature, emancipation, Douglas and Lincoln, the Civil War, autobiography, the 19th century novel, and historical fiction. In 2009, Harvard named him the Walter Channing Cabot Fellow for achievements and scholarly eminence in the fields of literature, history, and art. It is a great honor to have John here uh, giving us a lecture about Frederick Douglass. Um, now, with, uh, before I turn to John, I would like to invite uh, Lee Blake of the New Bedford Historical Society, um, one of our collaborators on this grand project, to say a few words about the book and about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you all for coming out this evening. I, I know you'll be enthralled. I'm always enthralled. I'm always fascinated by John's lectures. This is a fabulous book, if you have not seen it, Picturing Frederick Douglass, where John and Zoe actually find 170 photographs of Frederick Douglass. He's the most photographed person of the 19th century, so John will walk you through that. I'm with the New Bedford Historical Society, but I also work on campus, so one of my interests is also promoting New Bedford's local history. The New Bedford Historical Society is an organization that focuses on the history of people of color because essentially our history has really been pushed aside. So here we have this wonderful story about Frederick Douglass who comes to New Bedford when he's 20 years old and all our kids in the public schools hardly know any of that. They don't know about the wonderful history of people of color as they fought to end enslavement across this country, and that's part of my job is to make sure that our young people know those things. But I'm also happy to be here because this is a wonderful example of campuses 
and students working with local history and with local organizations. So I'm working with Pamela now, I'm working with many other people who have interns who are doing research and focusing on this and working on curriculum projects with young people in our schools so kids will have a pride in the place that they grew up in. John, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you, Pamela, for that for those very wonderful, generous introductions. I'll talk for about 45 minutes and then open it up to questions and show a lot of images uh, during the 45 minute talk. Uh, you should uh, take one of Lee Blake's walking tours, take one of her courses, read some of Frederick Douglass. I'll summarize a bit of his life and accomplishments outside of photography today and just start with the fact that one of the reasons I think you should read him is I've said this in print, I think Frederick Douglass is among the greatest, if not the greatest, nonfiction writer in certainly the United States and among, in the English language. He's stunning and I have not, I teach him every year, I have never had a student who had previously not been familiar with Douglass who comes away astounded at how good a writer he is. Uh, Douglass, uh, for those of you who know him, was the preeminent African American in the 19th century. Uh, he was, in his day, considered one of the greatest writers, one, perhaps the greatest order. In fact, he could command a higher speaking fee than any other peer. First, what's the evidence for this? You're good, and I need to tell you, because we had to add up all the other competitors. Douglas is one. In the book, we found 160 separate photographs rather than copies of the same negative. Uh, and we've actually, since the book came out in November of last year, we've discovered 11 new separate photographs. So he's now at 171 and counting. Second is George Custer, the boy general of the Civil War who was nothing if not a shameless self-promoter. He comes in with 155. Red Cloud, the Native American, uh, in his day, the most famous Native American has 128. Walt Whitman has 127, and Lincoln has 126. Now, I'll say U.S. Grant is a contender, but no one has analyzed, uh, done research, or added up the Grant archive. Uh, and Hal Holzer, who has written on Grant and I think knows the Grant archive better than anyone, uh, when I asked him how many separate photographs you think there are of Grant, before I told him how many I knew there were of Douglas, he said about 150, probably no more. So that's the evidence. Uh, and given Douglas's significance as a politician, as someone who devotes his life to ending slavery, racism, and tr to trying to achieve civil rights and human rights, equality before the law, socially, politically, legally, in every way, why would he devote so much time and energy to an art form, photography? Why would he write about it? He wrote more extensively on photography as well. He wrote four separate essays. The book publishes three of them, two for the first time, and I think they're among his greatest, uh, among his greatest essays, which is saying a lot. So it raises this question, why would this radical activist, this brilliant speaker and writer, be so obsessed with photography? There are really four reasons, and they relate to his desire to end slavery and racism and achieve civil rights. The first is he believed that photography was a fundamentally democratic medium. Louis Daguerre, the co-founder of photography, He's a Frenchman, and the Americans in particular love the daguerreotype in part because of its, the richness of its detail and the tone. Uh, Frederick Douglass called Louis Daguerre the greatest inventor of the age because he said for the first time in history, the poorest servant girl or a slave could have a photograph, or could have a portrait of herself that surpassed in detail, in beauty, in tone that of the most powerful king or queen 20 years ago, which is correct. And the, the, the vogue, the desire for photography was almost exclusively in portraits. People wanted portraits of themselves, their friends, their families, to be able to circulate, to hang on the walls, to put in photo albums. And now for the first time, 
anyone, no matter how poor you are, could afford to have a beautiful, accurate portrait of yourself. In fact, Douglas said that Daguerre is uh, the greatest inventor of modern times, or his time. The second is that Douglas identified photography with freedom. And here he recognized, as all scholars do today, that Americans had a love affair with photography that surpassed that of every other nation. Based on extant photographs, based on documents at the time, uh, Americans sat for their portraits, sat for their photograph far more than any other nation. And in fact, in order, it's United States, France, the German-speaking country, and then England. Now, what's significant about America's love affair for uh, photography is that love affair was limited chiefly to the northern states, the free states. The slave sta in the slave states, there is a notable paucity of photographers and a photograph circulating. Why was this? First, photography as a art form or medium depends upon a capitalist infrastructure. You need roads so that photographers can move from one place to another uh, because for a photographer you need to make money on having a certain uh, number of people nearby so you can uh, pay, your, pay your rent. Uh, and South didn't have that. There were very few cities. Another reason is that photography at this time, it was a, tr a profession. It was the age before amateur photography. So to learn the craft or the art, if you knew how to read, you could read a manual and you needed three to six months to experiment with the chemicals and try to put the instructions of the manual into practice. And if that happened, you're on the road, you're on your own. A lot of photographers created big wagons, they put their chemicals and cameras in there and they go from one town to the next throughout the north. Uh, or you could uh, spend a little more money and get a building in New York City or Boston. In New York City and there was a, a photography studio in every street corner by 1850. The South lacked not only the cities, it lacked that artisanal uh, ethos. In the South, if you were a struggling young man or woman, you wanted to become a planter or planter's wife. You didn't want to have to work with your hands. Your slaves did your work. So the fact that the Southerners lacked that craft ethos also was meant, uh, contributed to the comparative paucity of photography. And the final reason for the lack of phot photographs circulating in the South is that uh, Southerners vigorously censored, suppressed any criticism of white supremacy and slavery. And what they recognized was that a photograph of a person, whether it's a black person or a white person or a man or woman, highlighted that person's essential humanity. A photograph, a portrait of a person, in essence, was an anti-slavery document. And in fact, John C. Calhoun, the preeminent pro-slavery advocate, tried to pass a law, ban a federal law, banning the circulation of any image that Southerners could construe as anti-construe as anti-slavery anywhere in the South. He was able, unable in Congress, U.S. Congress, to pass that federal law, but every state and town through the post office, they systematically suppressed images and words and other criticisms of uh, their peculiar institution. Douglas and photography also came of age together. Uh, Douglas escapes from slavery in 1838, moves to New Bedford, works in New Bedford from 38 until 41, and uh, he then goes to Nantucket for his, it's really his first vacation, and he attends a national um, uh, abolition convention in Nantucket sponsored by the American Anti-Slavery Society. He had been preaching in New Bedford, he had been part of an abolitionist community in New Bedford, and he was renowned in New Bedford for being a good speaker. And William Lloyd Garrison and other leaders of the American Anti-Slavery Society heard him speak and offered him a full-time job as a paid lecture in which he would travel around the North converting multitudes to the cause of anti-slavery or abolition. And so in 1841, he becomes a public figure, writing, speaking for and to 
the masses. And that coincides with the first known photograph. It's this beautiful daguerreotype by Greg French, a, Boston, a friend of mine from Boston. Uh, and you have Douglas, this 23-year-old, 20, in this beautiful, uh, beautiful afro. But you see the contours of his fro, and he's, this is, a, a, in a sense, a representative pose. He's always well-dressed. He takes uh, his uh, sitting seriously. He wants to present himself as an equal citizen, as someone who is as deserving of entering the wealthiest parlor or even the White House as anyone. And his quest for freedom coincides with photography. The third reason for his love of photography, which is related to the other two and his attack on slavery and racism, is that he believed and recognized photography's fundamental truth value. Unlike all other forms of representation, he and almost all of his uh, counterparts in the 19th century believed that a photograph was an accurate representation of that person. A photograph did not lie. And in, in sense, we still believe that. How many people in this room, when they see a photograph on the front page of the Wall Street Journal of the New York Times, doubt its truthfulness? Any hands? One. Usually there are a few more skeptics. But we still, even though we know we can airbrush and make multiple exposures, airbrush out unwanted people, make multiple exposures, solarize, manipulate the heck out of a print, we still have faith in the truth value of the camera. And even then, photographers themselves knew that their photographs lied. They could make multiple exposures. They could airbrush out unwanted subjects. They could manipulate photographs then. But people still had faith in the truth value. The difference was Douglas and his peers saw photography both as a rigorously accurate technology and as a beautiful art form. And in the 20th century, if it was a technology, it was suddenly no longer as great an art form. So that's when photographs started uh, appearing at the bottom end of the art hierarchy in museums and in universities. So that's, hence Douglas's love of photography, his writing of photography, coincided with this larger mission of uh, democracy in which everyone is equal before the law and in society. One example, and Douglas also recognized early on the power that photography had. In fact, Douglas came to believe, in fact said, that a photograph elected Abraham Lincoln. He said the portrait makes the president after Lincoln was elected. And Lincoln, when he's elected in 1860, is the first anti-slavery president in American history. And Douglas was referring to the Brady, the Matthew Brady photograph of Lincoln on the left. It's right before Lincoln gives his Cooper Union speech when he's introduced to an East Coast audience. Lincoln was a dark horse in the election. People outside of Illinois basically didn't know him. So he comes to New York, it's an important speech because he's introducing himself to an East Coast audience. And this is the first photograph of Lincoln in which he appears presidential. As you all know, Lincoln's 6'4", gangly, the three adjectives most used to describe him are ugly, awkward, and grotesque. Before this photograph, every other photograph, he had a bad hair day. This he actually does look like a leader, presidential. Matthew Brady said, said he spent an hour trying to get his cuffs right and everything. And then this was transmitted through an engraving to Harper's Weekly, the most widely circulated newspaper in the country, and it's on the front page before the Republican nomination. And Americans at the time, because of the rise of photography, because of the rise of engraving, because of the rise of the Illustrated Press, Americans wanted to be able to visibly recognize their candidate. Before this Brady portrait, they could, people on the East Coast couldn't. According to Matthew Brady, after Lincoln was elected, he wrote Brady and thanked him and said, your portrait elected me. Now that's according to Matthew Brady. But uh, Douglas said the same thing, a lot of people felt that way. What's significant about the transfer process from a photograph to an engraving, it's the age before the halftone, 
is that Americans believed in the truthfulness of an engraving based on a photograph as much as they believed on the underlying photograph. In fact, the, the illustrated press ignored the transfer process. The, uh, the uh, title of the Lincoln photograph is it doesn't say engraving based on a Brady photograph. It simply says, you can't really read it, I'll read it for you. It says photograph by Brady. They treat it as a photograph. Uh, and that's one of the things that fueled Douglas's writings on uh, photography. There's a campaign button that uh, is widely circulated of the Brady photograph in the 1860 election. That, and th this image, this Brady image, becomes ubiquitous. Here's Douglas, Daguerre, half plate Daguerre type in 1852, and this becomes really his signature style, even more so than the earliest one. He stares defiantly into the camera lens. He is, has a stern expression because slavery is expanding and he needs to be stern. He faces, confronts his viewer, confronts his audience. One convert who saw this photograph, heard him speak, and was converted to the cause of anti-slavery society, I think wonderfully captured Douglas's look. She said he looks majestic in his wrath. And it's the perfect pose for this radical uh, activist. Majestic in his wrath. Looking beautiful. In a sense, Douglas, through his photographs, through his writing, through his public speaking, he out-citizened white citizens at a time in which most white Americans believe that blacks could not be or should not be citizens. That's part of the discipline that he brought with him. By after the Civil War, he's on the cover of Harper's Weekly. I mean, that would be like being on the cover. There's no analog today. It'd be like being on the cover of Time magazine in 1940 or 50 when everyone saw it. Or being uh, featured in CBS News when there's only three television stations. Uh, that gives you a sense of the dissemination of his images. Douglas's portraits were public portraits. They were designed to bolster his public image, designed to help him fight the cause of ending racism, achieving human rights, slavery. Most were studio portraits taken while on the road. Douglas traveled immensely as a public speaker. And almost wherever he went, he would sit for a photograph. Uh, a few of them, however, portray Douglas in the arts for which he is best known. These are not representative photographs. The next three I'm going to show you, but they're, they're very rare, and I, want to, I think they're magnificent. Here's Douglas mid-speech. He's best known as an orator. He delivers uh, his signature speech, which becomes self-made man after the Civil War, at Tuskegee Institute before 5,000 people on commencement day in 1892, three years before he dies. And uh, um, if you just draw a straight line down, you see the young African-American on the chair. That's Booker T. Washington right there. There's Douglas standing. Uh, you see Douglas standing, Booker T is three to the left. Here's another photograph. It's a daguerreotype from 1850. It's an anti-fugitive slave law convention. It's, again, very rare because to obtain this kind of a photograph, you need to, the exposure times on a bright sunny day were 15, 20 seconds. If it was a cloudy day, the photographer didn't have work. That was the limits of the medium. And here Douglas is sitting down on the right. His friend and fellow abolitionist Garrett Smith is mid-speech gesticulating. Douglas, after Garrett finishes, will stand up and give his own speech. Here's Douglas at his desk writing. Again, these are not representative photographs. Uh, but extremely rare. Uh, and Douglas was not interested in uh, photographs of his family. He was not interested in personal mementos. He was not interested in circulating his private self. 
In fact, there are no extant images of Frederick Douglass with his first wife, Anna Murray. And of his five children, there is only one photograph of Douglass with any of his five children, and it's with his youngest daughter, Annie, which is right here. This actually wasn't in the book, because we discovered this in, a, uh, in an archive in Baton Rouge about three months ago. Annie uh, dies in 1860 uh, from an illness. Douglas, according to most accounts, Douglas was emotionally most attached to Annie. And you see him slumping down, so it elevates Annie. It makes Annie look more mature, more significant. Uh, no other photographs of Douglas and his siblings. Uh, there are a few photographs of Douglas with his second wife, Helen Pitts, who he marries in the 1880s after Anna dies. This is a photograph uh, where Helen is on the right and her sister is on the left. It's a parlor shot. Here is a uh, photograph of Helen and Frederick uh, during their honeymoon trip, they're at Niagara Falls. This is a false facade. So it's a painting which they sit in front of and then have their portrait taken. You can tell by the waves on the rocks on the right. His visual identity was meant to unite politics, unite art with politics. In fact, Douglas said the moral and social influence of pictures was more important in shaping national culture than the making of its laws. Circulating a photograph is more important than changing the laws in transforming society. That's a profound statement that captures his belief in photography in the ways I mentioned. So it leads who photographed Douglas? 171 photographs, who photographed him? They, it was a very inclusive group, uh, both because of the profession and because of Douglas. It included women and men, whites and blacks, southerners and northerners. Photography itself was a, a, an open profession because there were few barriers to entry. The start, startup costs were not that great. And unlike painting or sculpture, or silver make, silversmithing, or a lot of other crafts, you didn't need to train with a master craftsperson, almost always a man, who, in, in, who if you were a woman or if you were black, say, I'm not going to train you. You could learn this craft on your own. There are thousands of women in the first five decades, perhaps more, but we know there are at least thousands, close to 10,000, maybe more female photographers. And there are some of the preeminent photographers were African-American photographers. So here's some examples. Here's Lydia Cadwell, a Chicago artist and entrepreneur, photographing uh, Douglas in these two beautiful cabinet cards, a profile portrait and a frontal portrait. Here's Cornelius Batty in 1893, before he, an African-American photographer who then becomes a teacher, an instructor of photography at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. Washington and Tuskegee also recognized the importance of photography for African Americans. This is Phineas Headley and James Reed from New Bedford. They're an interracial partnership. And they photograph Frederick and his grandson, Joseph. Now, you might think this is a family shot or personal shot. It's really a public shot because Joseph was an internationally renowned concert violinist. And it, the, the photograph occurs after Douglas had given a speech at a venue and then Joseph played on the violin and it's to commemorate this public evening or public event. Here's James here in Easton who was from Rochester, Minnesota, uh, part of the well-known black abolitionist Easton family, many members of which lived in Boston. And here's James Presley Ball from Cincinnati, Ohio, two, of, uh, two photographs of Frederick Douglass. The actual prints aren't in great shape, but Ball was considered uh, by, Glee, by, by a Boston newspaper, a newspaper in which Southworth and Hawes, many photo critics and historians say that Southworth and Hawes 
Gleason's Pictorial, the first illustrated magazine, did a whole feature on James P. Ball in Cincinnati and said that James P. Ball was the greatest living photographer. I'll quote Gleason's. It said that Ball photographed with an accuracy and a softness of expression unsurpassed, unsurpassed by any establishment in the Union. And for most people, accuracy coupled with softness of expression tone was what made a great photograph. Famous photographers also have photo. This is, I should say, Ball's studio in Cincinnati. And so a studio, when you wait for your, to sit for your photograph and then you wait until it's developed and you could walk home with it, they were, they, they were designed to look like middle class parlors. And this is a model interracial integrated middle class parlor because Ball's patrons are blacks and whites, men and women. Famous photographers also photographed Douglas. This is, a, I think, a beautiful Matthew Brady uh, carte de visite. Notice the little sparkle in his eyes. Brady captures the light reflecting off his pupils beautifully. John Howe Kent, Rochester, and Douglas is living in Rochester. He moves to Rochester after becoming legally free. Uh, uh, while he's in England, Ireland, Scotland, owing to the success of his first uh, narrative, his autobiography. It's so successful that he, uh, he names names, and the reason that he writes in the first place is because he's such a good public speaker that he's increasingly accused of being a fraud. And truth-telling and honesty is so important. He decides to throw caution to the wind and name names, name who his masters were, name where he lived. Because when he was a fugitive speaking on the lecture circuit, he didn't say who his masters were, where exactly he lived, he'd get recaptured. So the book is a huge success. The American Anti-Slavery Society sends him to British Isles. They purchase his uh, sympathizers in Britain, purchase his freedom. He comes back to the United States and settles in Rochester. This is the kind of Russian Rochesterian winter look. <laughs> after the war. And it's George Kendall Warren, a Boston, Cambridge-based photographer, uh, is a carte de visite. It's a small, it's known for a visiting card, and then it appears in Douglass's uh, 1881 edition of his third autobiography, Life and Times. And here is Douglass. You see him circled. Uh, at Lincoln's second inaugural. You can see Lincoln, see the podium uh, in the, the left third, Lincoln is standing, he's tall, he's reading his second inaugural address, and you see how close Douglas is. Douglas has a front row seat. Douglas was invited to the second inaugural, he's invited to the reception at the White House, he goes to the White House after Lincoln gives his address. Lincoln is in the elegant East Room, he sees Douglas enter, Lincoln's surrounded by a crowd of whites, and Lincoln raises his long arm, and he says, here comes my friend Frederick Douglass. I saw you in the crowd today. Of course he saw him. Look how close he is. Lincoln then says, what did you think of my address? There is no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. And Douglass responded, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. This is a remarkable, uh, I think, image. You also see in this image, I've now circled John Wilkes Booth in the balcony on the right, up to the right, scouting out Lincoln because he wants to, uh, initially he wants to kidnap him and use him for ransom to demand the release of all Confederate prisoners of war. And then once Lee surrenders, Booth just decides to kill Lincoln. Douglas saw his role in portraiture not as an objectified subject, but as an artist or performer. In fact, I see him as, I, I, I call his relationship with the photographer and the camera part of a pas de trois, or dance for three, so to speak. Um, because given the exposure times, uh, it required a subject who was really invested in obtaining the best look possible. Douglas says that the photographic process was difficult. He calls it one of stern serenity. And he said it was all too common to produce, quote, something statue-like in subjects, which he wanted to avoid. 
So he confronted the challenge much as a dancer did, hence I use the term pas de trois. He performs for the photographer, staying still during the exposure, appreciating the crucial role of timing, lighting, and set design. And we think he developed his own aesthetic. Most of his portraits are closely cropped. There are a few backdrops, a few props at a time in which props and backdrops and scenes in the background were common. Such objects detracted from his solemn, dignified persona of a black man demanding citizenship and equality. And when he did use a prop, it was significant. Here, Douglas is shown with Lincoln's cane after Lincoln dies. Mary Todd gave, Lincoln, or gave Douglas one of Lincoln's canes as a tribute, and as, uh, as a tribute to uh, their friendship and Douglas's influence on Lincoln. Here's Douglas, a beautiful carte de visite by Ives and Andrews. Douglas is uh, sitting at a table with a book uh, to highlight his role as a public intellectual. And here's Douglas as an older man sitting in a chair with the arms carved like lions, which captured his own Leonine mythology. He, at the time, lived in this large home that looked down on the Capitol. It's now the National Park Service Douglas home. If you haven't gone, you should. Uh, and he was widely referred to as the Lion of Anacostia. So he's holding the arm of a lion carved, uh, or the lion carved arm of a chair. Photographers loved working with him. In fact, one friend said she owned, quote, more than 20 pictures of Douglas, separate pictures and added that the photographers are running after him to sit for them. Everyone, every photographer wanted Douglas to sit for them. Douglas's portraits like speeches and writings continually evolved. So let me give you a sense of Douglas's own evolution. The first image which I showed you, this is when exposure times are in the minutes. So it's understandable why he appears somewhat statue-like as he later said, which was common. And he might have a, a, it was very common to have a prop to stick your head in so your head wouldn't move, but you had to keep your eyes open, you couldn't move your facial expression. Uh, and uh, it appears somewhat statue-like. But he experiments. Here's a look that's known as the visionary gaze. Photo photography manuals instructed male, white male subjects to look above or beyond the camera lens. And a visionary gaze is a way to evoke their visionary capacity, their statesmanlike quality. And so he tries it out. But you see, when you look, his, uh, his right eye, there's shadow over his, uh, the, his, his right eye, what we look at as the left. Uh, it doesn't, it's a beautiful photograph, but that visionary gaze doesn't quite work. And here he's looking down in askance. Another beautiful photograph, but it's still not the pose really that he wants. And he discovers this pose in roughly late 1840s, early 1850s, uh, staring defiantly in the camera lens, the, the pose of majestic wrath or wrathful majesty. This is probably the most, not probably, is the most widely circulated, the best known photograph of Douglas. Uh, until after the Civil War. It's the frontispiece. It's a, this is an engraving based on a lost photograph. It's the frontispiece for his second autobiography. And you see him adding an aspect to that majestic wrath in which his fists, he's closing his hands into a fist, daring someone, challenging someone to defy his de demand for freedom and equality. Here's an unusual profile portrait because a profile portrait was reserved primarily for statesmen and visionary men. He couples the profile portrait with the clenched fists. Another beautiful photograph. And here is what the only known photograph of Douglas explicitly smiling. He almost never showed a smile with this notable exception. Almost to the end of his life, Douglas ref wanted to refute the racist caricatures which were disseminated all over the place of blacks as happy slaves and servants. 
And here in 1894, a year before he dies, it's as though he is now so famous. His stature is so secure he can finally let his guard down and show a smile. So the three large themes that stand out is he almost never shows a smile. He always appears as a dignified, respectable citizen. The, the um, majestically wrathful look through the Civil War and then the visionary statesman because he is an elder statesman. He becomes a major leader in the Republican Party. And the third is that Douglas's visual persona, much like his, his own life, he continually evolves from revolutionary freedom fighter to elder statesman. And in fact, I've, I, I've argued that Douglas in 1835 is fundamentally, profoundly different from who he is in uh, 1840 and 45 and 50 and 55, and he changes most dramatically in the Civil War. And Douglas embraced that. Douglas imagined and wanted the idea of a self to be continually evolving in a state of constant flux rather than fixed. Because someone who continually evolves and is in a state of constant flux that person explodes the very definitions of slavery and racism because slavery is predicated on this very low fixed ceilings above which no one can rise. And racism, among other things, is based on the belief that some people are permanently inferior to other people. Douglas also was considered one of the, if not the preeminent self-made man and self-made, self-making for Douglas, Douglas also championed self-making for women. Also, he conceived of that as someone who continually evolves. And it wasn't about getting rich. The true self-made man or woman for Douglas was a reformer. As you improve yourself, as you continually evolve, you seek to improve and reform your society. You seek to eradicate the sins of your society, as Douglas said. Perhaps the most noticeable visual marker of Douglas's ev continued evolution can be seen in his facial hair. Now, 19th century men experimented with facial hair, but few did so as frequently as Douglas. Douglas tracked and often led prevailing fashions. In the 1840s, a clean-shaven look was most prevalent, writes Joan Severa, who has a book on dress for photography, and it's, it's the best book there is on understanding 19th century fashion for men and women. And then he, drew, he grew chin whiskers. You can see his chin whiskers right here, just little whiskers on the chin. And then he, these chin whiskers evolved into a crop fringe of mutton chop whiskers in this portrait, so the whiskers come down right here through his chin. And then in the mid-1850s, he became a trendsetter with a full beard and hair covering his ears, which was not popular until late in the decade. He then began sporting a goatee, which he kept until about 1863. January of 1864, he anticipates another trend with a sporty walrus mustache, which was not common for another two decades. 1865, he couples the walrus mustache with a short ponytail. Here's Frederick Douglass with a ponytail. 1873, he briefly grows a full beard, and within a year he shaved his chin whiskers while retaining bushy sideburns that loop up to connect to his mustache. In 1875, he maintains a neatly groomed full beer, anticipating a look affected by authority figures in the 1880s, and his hair and his beer grow until his death, and this is one of two deathbed photographs of Douglas several hours after he died. The evolution of his appearance, like his portraits, as I said, indicated his status as a self-made man. His portrait gallery contributed to his persona as one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent, self-made man in the United States. Now, after Douglas died, his portrait served a crucial, important visual legacy in the 20th century and beyond. It continued to inspire art and artists that could break down racial barriers. 
In a profound way, Douglas took advantage of the new technology of his day in much the same way that many activists are taking advantage of the new technology of our day from Twitter and Facebook to cell phone photos and videos. So for example, many African Americans with the rise of Black Lives Matters won't leave home without a camera because they want to make sure if they're accosted by the police, that camera will tell the truth. It begins with Frederick Douglass. It begins with Frederick Douglass and his emphasis on the camera's truth value it's a bill and its ability to capture the essential humanity in every person. Douglas's portraits inspired artists to create thousands of murals, sculptures, paintings, prints, drawings, and posted stamps and magazine covers after his death. His visual legacy protested lynching and segregation. It lobbied for civil rights and it celebrated black power. It dignified the black body that white Americans have so often tried to destroy, as Ta-Nehisi Coates noted in his recent, in my view, wonderful book. So let me show you some of the legacy Douglas photographs. He's on the cover of Life magazine in 1968. This is at a time in which it's the height of the civil rights, but everyone saw this photograph. It's based on this six-plate daguerreotype. Now, daguerreotype is a unique one-of-a-kind object, so it's the, the life had to go into the archive, photograph it, and they put it on the cover. And this life photograph then becomes the basis for Daniel Fichter's wonderful mural at the King Open School in Cambridge, a few blocks from where I live. And it's actually a magnificent mural. This is just a detail showing Douglas uh, among a larger group of activists. This is Lloyd Lilly's sculpture of Frederick Douglass in Faneuil Hall. I'm showing you uh, murals and, and statues and other uh, legacy images, primarily in Massachusetts, because we're in Massachusetts. But I, if I were in Chicago, I would show you some just limited to Chicago. If I were in LA, I'd show you some just limited to LA. And you see that this sculpture is based on Douglass's frontispiece. Here's Deborah Browder and Heidi Short, Frederick Douglass, and Roxbury Mass, based on, on the right John White Hearn's cabinet card. Here's a U.S. postage stamp. Uh, Douglass had two postage stamps, one from 95, uh, one in the 60s, based on a uh, card de visite. And notice how the artist turns Douglass's finger from down to up. This is an anti-racism mural in Belfast, Northern Ireland, based on Matthew Brady's card de visite. If any of you go to Belfast, it is the most visible image in Belfast. It's on a mural on a wall that stands high on a hill. You can't miss it in most places in Belfast. And a version, or a similar version, as most of you know, appears in New Bedford. It's a beautiful mural. It's worth spending time with, actually taking your family, friends, students, and doing a close reading of the mural, uh, Labor History Mural in uh, 2001. Douglas helped launch one of the great battles in American history, a battle between racist stereotypes and dignified self-possession. Across 50 years of photographs, Douglas fought for the public image of African Americans as equal citizens. Across the next 120 years, in his visual afterlife, the photographs have fought on. Thank you.